Right, today I got a monumental basketball player pickup. Got it in the mail this weekend and I'm uh, gonna tell the story of this guy and why he's monumental to the sport of basketball. But let's start off, as you can see, I got five of the greatest basketball players of all time in this lineup. Arguably, you can argue for any of these guys, it's all debatable as to who's the GOAT, you know, according to opinion. My opinion is Michael Jordan, but you can easily argue the case as any of these other guys next to Michael Jordan here as the greatest of all time. Starting off with, you got Shaquille O'Neal, the most dominant basketball player in NBA history. You got Michael Jordan. Like I said, he's the GOAT in my opinion, greatest of all time. You got Kobe Bryant, the Black Mamba. You got LBJ, LeBron James. You got Magic Johnson. But there's one guy that should be in this lineup that is not up there right now. And his name, or should I start off by saying his nickname is Mr. Basketball. And that is George Mikeyan. So this right here is a 1952 Wheaties George Mikeyan card. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about George Mikeyan. So we're gonna put George Mike in center stage right here. The reason why I say this guy is monumental to basketball is he pretty much laid the foundation for the game. The shot clock violation, or basically the shot clock was invented because of George Mike. George Mike was pretty much the Shaquille O'Neal of the 1940s and early 1950s. He was uh, probably the biggest, most dominant player in the league at that time. And uh, actually, he's pre-NBA. There was no NBA when he started uh, playing professional basketball. But he was the, the most dominant player. He was basically the Shaquille O'Neal of his era. At that time, in 1948, when he turned pro, he was uh, six foot ten, 250 pounds. And back then, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't have supplement, weightlifting supplements, and all this stuff. So, along with his height, he was also a pretty big, pretty big guy, man, for his era. And uh, the reason why the shot clock violation was created was because. The only way teams could beat George Mikan to stop him was if once they got a lead on the Lakers, they would start passing the ball around, just killing the clock, you know, killing time. Because I'm assuming since there was no shot clock, there must have been a time limit on when the game would end. You know, the game was probably played for a certain amount of time. So what they would do, the team, once they had a lead, was they would just keep playing keep away, basically. So to make it fair, they created a, a shot clock. And uh, because there had been teams that started doing that to the Lakers because of George Mikan. Another rule that was created because of George Mikan was goaltending. George Mikan being as tall as he was, possibly the tallest player in the in the pro basketball at that time. Anytime anybody went up to take a shot, he'd knock it out of the air because he was so tall. So they had to create goaltending because I guess George Mikan was blocking everybody's stuff goaltending. So they created goaltending because of George Mikan. And on top of that, he uh, created the hook shot. Now, a lot of people, you know, when you hear a hook shot, 
I think of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I guess Kareem Abdul-Jabbar maybe mastered it. They called it the sky hook with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But George Jamaican, he, he was the creator of the hook shot. And then also, uh, if you ever played uh, basketball, you know, in elementary school or, you know, for the rec center, you probably heard, you know, back in the day, I don't know if they still do it, but they had layup drills and they called them the Mikan drill, named after George Mikan. So, you know, with all, the, pretty much he laid the foundation for the sport. It, the game evolved because of George Mikan, which, who was known as Mr. Basketball. That says it all right there. <clears throat> then uh, on top of all that, the reason why he should be in this lineup is he's a seven-time champ. Now, like I said, he's pre-NBA. So some of his championships, they're from the NBL. There was no NBA. It was called the NBL, National Basketball League. And uh, so, but he has seven championships as a professional basketball player. But they were pre-NBA, a uh, good number of them. Some of them were NBA, but uh, some of them were with the NBL, which was pre-NBA. Hopefully not confusing anybody. <clears throat> and on top of all that, the NBA created a list of the 50 greatest basketball players in history. And George Mikan got elected to the, to the 50 greatest basketball players ever. So that's another reason why he should be up there. And on top of all that, I'm going to tell you his resume right now. Actually, it's not. I'm not going to give you his full resume because it goes on for days, man. He's a seven-time champion. He was an NBL MVP in 1948, which was his rookie year. He was an NBA All-Star MVP, four-time scoring champion. And let me get back to that since we're talking about scoring champ. He was a four-time scoring champ. What you see with LeBron today, how LeBron, you know, his, as a team, LeBron's teams have been successful is usually as a shooter. You know, whether it was uh, KR, uh, Kyrie Irving, uh, what was the other guy, JR, uh, was it JR Smith? LeBron always had a shooter because what LeBron does, when he takes it to the hole, everybody focuses in on him. LeBron kicks the ball out to a shooter and that shooter knocks down the three. Usually if you have a good shooter with LeBron James, usually going to be a successful uh, season because, and that's what the Lakers were missing the first year uh, LeBron was there. They had no shooters. Nobody could shoot worth a lick. And that's why they didn't even make the playoffs with LeBron James on that team. So if you put some shooters with LeBron James, a lot of times they're gonna, it's, it's a, it's almost a guaranteed that team's going to make it to the finals. So anyways, George Mikan, you know, he, he uh, a lot of players would focus on him when he got the ball and he would kick it out because, you know, he was a scoring machine. But uh, anyways, getting off subject. So he's a four-time scoring champ. He's on the NBA 25th anniversary team, the NBA 35th, 35th anniversary team, NBA... 50, 50 greatest players of all time. He's a sporting news player of the year. And his number's retired by DePaul College, the DePaul Blue Devils, and also the Los Angeles Lakers. And top of all that, uh, they have a statue of him uh, in front of the Minnesota Timberwolves Stadium, I do believe, doing a hook shot. And then after his playing days, he got into coaching, Coached the Lakers in 1957, 1958, I do believe. And then, I don't know if everybody heard of the ABA. There used to be a, two leagues, the NBA and the a ABA. He was the founder of the ABA. So he's had his, his hand in pro basketball on the court and off the court. Not only that, 
he sued the NBA and got pensions for players, pro basketball players who were pre-NBA, before the NBA blew up, took off. Because, uh, you know, there was players in the 40s, like himself, you know, the Minneapolis Lakers, they were a part of the NBL, but he got pensions uh, for those guys. So that being said, I think George Mikan uh, is monumental to the sport of basketball, period. But uh, what I like about this card, and I think it's uh, his cards, get, this Wheaties card, it's it's a. Uh, it's a little bit pricey, but not. it's not going to break the bank. And I think uh, these cards, Wheaties cards, are undervalued. And let me tell you why. George Mikeyan, that I know of, only has one official card. He has a 1948 Bowman rookie card. And that card right there, you're not going to find it for cheap. That sucker... Even in the authentic, you're probably looking at a beat up George Mike in an authentic card with paper loss, you know, creased, probably going to cost you starting $1,500 on up in just the authentic. Then when you start getting into uh, George Mike in 48 Bowman's that actually got a numeric grade, they go all the way up to like 69000 So... The next best thing, unless you got thousands of dollars, is he has a 1948 Kellogg's card. And then he also has, uh, gosh, I forget what they're called. They're like postcards. Uh, B. Roth 6 just had a Satchel Page, their black and white card. Uh, darn it, I forget what they're called. But he has another one, it's a black and white card, kind of looks like a, a postcard in a way. And then you got the 52 Wheaties. He has two cards in the 52 Wheaties. The in action and a portrait card. I got the portrait on the way, I already purchased it. And I'm just waiting on that right now. But that's why I think because he only has one official card, you know, the Bowman, I think the Kellogg's and the Wheaties are undervalued because basketball cards after 1948, the 1948 Bowman set, Bowman and Tops, they didn't make a set, basketball card set until 1957 when that's when the Bill Russell rookie came. So for like a nine year span, there was no basketball cards being made. The only basketball cards where you're going to find was something like this, the Wheaties cards. So these 52 Wheaties, I guess Wheaties uh, was putting cards on their boxes. They had a total of 60 cards in the set. So there's a Yogi Berra, Bob Feller, Ted Williams, multiple sports, multiple players. But the reason why I focus on the George Mikan and the 52 Wheaties, as cool as the Yogi Berra and the Ted Williams cards are in that weedy set is Yogi Berra, the basketball players, the football players, they had cards, official cards being made during that time. So those are like oddball cards. But to me, I don't consider this an oddball, oddball card because there was no cards being made for basketball in 1952. So, with George Mikan only having a, a 1948 Bowman rookie, uh, and then he's got a 1948 Kellogg serial card, and then uh, there's another card, uh, can't remember the, the manufacturer of it, looks kind of like a postcard in a way, and then you got this Wheaties card, the two Wheaties cards. So, that's why I think, because of all his accomplishments, and no basketball cards being made in the 50s until 1957. I think these cards are undervalued. And in 1957, George Mikan didn't have a card in the 1957 tops. 
because he was coaching. He was already done playing. And I don't think they made coaches cards in that set. So that's why I think uh, the Kellogg's and the Wheaties cards of George Mikan are undervalued. But uh, very happy to add George Mikan, being a Lakers fan and uh, just his history and what he did for the game of basketball. This uh, is a great card to add to the collection, man. As you can see, uh, they were hand cut because they were on cereal boxes. And he does have another card. I have it on the way. Hopefully it shows up this week when I get it in. I'll show it on one of my uh, mail day videos. But uh, if you're a basketball fan, you know, now you know about a little history about George Mikan if you ain't heard about him. Now you know a little bit about him. Maybe uh, put him on your radar. Put him on your watch list. Because uh, these cards raw, you can pick them up for a couple hundred bucks, you know, or maybe a hundred. I don't know. The prices are all over the all over the place on these things. But uh, once they get graded, these cards can uh, they start to go up a little bit. So uh, if you want a George Mikan in your collection and you don't have fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars to buy an authentic one. Or twenty, sixty thousand dollars, twenty to sixty thousand dollars to buy a numerically graded one. This is an option, Mister Basketball, George Mikan. So uh, check out George Mikan stories. You can look him up on uh, Wikipedia. You can find numerous YouTube videos on his career. But uh, don't forget about George Mikan, man. If you're a basketball collector. It's a great addition to the set, man. Read up on this guy. Catch you on the next one.